Welcome to Type Tune Tint. I'm Tom Kranz. Spit polished and squared away, Zach Tidwell enlisted in the U.S. Marine Corps right out of high school. He served as a machine gunner with 3rd Battalion 5th Marines for four years, reaching the rank of E-5 Sergeant. He deployed twice, but never saw combat. His real battles began shortly after his divorce in 2018. A motorcycle accident triggered an emotional spiral into darker and darker places. A traumatic brain injury, an alcohol addiction, and a failed suicide attempt that left him totally blind. But what followed was an amazing story of a life reinvented, a story that's still unfolding, a story that we are privileged to hear today. And I'm joined now by Zach Tidwell from his palatial estate in the Denver area of Colorado. Uh, Zach, good morning. I'm glad you could join me at this early hour. Yeah, thanks for having me on. And the the palatial, I, I like that. Yeah, well, of course, your palatial estate. I'm in my palatial yeah. estate in northern New Jersey here. Uh, you know, we all have to have a palatial estate or, you know, what, what, what what's the point, right? Yeah, you're so, not. So um, I, I, I was attracted to Zach's story, folks, because Zach is like a melting, he's a, a, a walking melting pot of stories that affect like multiple constituencies out in the world, right? He's a military veteran, so there's that audience. He's a, uh, he, he, we, we talk about addiction and recovery, so there's that audience. He's a suicide survivor, so there's that audience. And then he is a, a self-taught coder and game programmer who started his own company and invented an app. And so there's, a, there's there's that audience. So it's like we're doing five podcasts in one here, and hopefully it won't take us five hours, but we'll shoot for like half an hour or so. So um, what you're doing today, let's start there, is you uh, have this company called Dark Horse Game Studios, correct? Yeah. And tell me about that and what is that all about that you're doing today? Yeah, so I'm actually, I'm in the process of starting another business that will still be software stuff, but I can't really get into the details of right now. But with Dark Horse, it was all, <clears throat> after I started teaching myself how to code, the, the goal was to create games that everyone could play, regardless of whether or not they have a disability. And so as I taught myself how to code, that was, I wanted to make sure that I could do everything, including all the visuals and make my apps present as normally as they can, even though they probably look boring because the totally blind guy <laughs> made them, but they, <laughs> they act normally if you don't have any disabilities, but if you do like from the entire range of visual impairments from color blindness, all the way down to total blindness, the game automatically adapts to your device settings and, and will make things more usable. So it'll use high contrast instead of, you know, more, visually aesthetic colors and things like that all the way down to where my phone can read the the elements of the app out loud or even deaf blind people can use it with braille we have these devices called refreshable braille displays that are essentially just little pins that stick out of the the back of a like from a recessed area and can form the braille alphabet and so they can play it with those or people with spinal cord injuries can play it with their voice and so i'm trying to build the company hopefully is a pipe dream is to have it become a larger company where I have other developers underneath me. And this is what we do is make things that are accessible to everyone. Gotcha. Well, you know, every company that uh, turns out to be a big deal starts as, you know, one guy or one gal in their basement or their bedroom or their living room, just like you. So, you know, well, we'll be keeping I'm in my I'm in my palatial estate, so I'm yeah, starting of off yeah, better well, than there. <laughs> that's for you and me here. So yeah. I, uh, I guess that we should go back, and I should uh, point out to everybody, which I didn't say in the very beginning, but that you are completely blind, and you are deaf in one ear. And tell us how that happened. Yeah, so on my second deployment in the Marine Corps, I served as a machine gunner, but I never saw combat, but... I found out that my, my wife was having an affair with someone else and I was struggling with it, but did all right with it. When I came back, um, we eventually filed for divorce. And then I was just trying to keep myself really busy. And one of those things that I did to keep myself really busy was I would take my dirt bike out to a racetrack every weekend. And I was in a really nasty motorcycle accident um, about 
what, four months after I got back from that deployment and had a, a severe traumatic brain injury. And it really kind of changed everything for me. I became very impulsive. I started having sleeping issues and really started to struggle mentally where I just couldn't really escape the stuff that was bothering me with, with the divorce. And so that was March of 2018. I was honorably discharged from the Marine Corps in August of 2018. And then was going to school and keeping up appearances that I was doing all right. And I just wasn't, and I really leaned into alcohol and just went down a darker and darker hole essentially. Um, and in March of 2019, about nine months after I got out of the Marines, I shot myself in the head and that was intentionally to trying to kill myself. But you obviously did not succeed. And instead, <laughs> you woke up in a hospital alive. Yeah, they, they took me off of life support. And when I came to, I found out that not only was I still alive, but I was now, I'd gone from what I thought was a dark place to a literal dark place and was totally blind and deaf in one ear. Uh, among some other smaller things, like I don't have any sense of smell and I've got a lot of nerve damage in my face and stuff like that. And ended up having facial reconstruction surgery and they, I mean, I had to relearn how to do everything. So I learned how to eat again. I learned how to, we, you know, we started from, all right, it's, you have to sit up in the bed instead of laying in the bed to standing next to the bed to now we're going to learn how to brush your teeth and learn everything. And how old were you when this was going at, the, at that moment in time? I had just turned, I was 23 when I shot myself. Wow. So. Um, in the hospital, relearning how to do everything. And I was in the hospital for 51 days and then went home to live with my parents for a month. And then the VA actually has blind rehab centers all around the country. There's 13 of them. And so the VA sent me to school essentially to learn how to be blind. And so I attended classes seven hours a day where I relearned now that I had basic skills, like taking care of myself back together. I learned how to do normal stuff like cooking and cleaning and using a computer and all that stuff. You know, I must, I'm just guessing, I, I, obviously I don't have the experience of being blind, but as somebody who f initially had sight, I guess you have in your mind, you've got lots of frames of references. So for example, making your way around the kitchen is probably maybe easier and, you know, doing so even simple things like walking down a sidewalk, at least you have kind of a vision of, of what those things are, right? I would think so. I mean, I, I would imagine that has to have helped me. And, but those skills have grown over the past couple of years too. just my spatial awareness and being able to mentally form maps of, of where I'm at. And, you know, when I was living in downtown Denver, I would walk, it was about a 20 minute walk to my jujitsu gym. I would walk to and from jujitsu every day when I went to class and stuff like that. Like I, and yeah, that was like in the beginning, I couldn't even, if someone was talking to me, I would turn the wrong way because I couldn't, oh. couldn't tell where the sound was coming from oh, because of that deafness in one ear. But you know, when you're crossing streets, totally blind, you just listen to traffic and decide when it's time to go. And you just, it's kind of wild how the body adapts. I'm uh, curious about, so you mentioned the VA, you know, over the, as a, as a consumer of news, I watch way too much news on TV. And, you know, the VA has come under some criticism over the years, but what would you, would you say that your experience, I mean, that they basically helped take care of you? I had a really incredible experience, at least while I was there for rehab purposes and all that stuff and have since with the blind rehab programs. Mm -hmm. I think most of the issues tend to be because it is such a giant organization. It's, it's with the regular stuff um gotcha. you know the okay i need to go see my doctor like i told you before <laughs> that we started my face is super swollen right now from jujitsu on friday my eye is swollen shut and there's concerns with that just because of where the metal is in my face but like i can't just go to my doctor or schedule a quick appointment it'll i can either go to the er there or it'll be a month before i see my doctor um, gotcha. which doesn't really do it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so there are obstacles, but it's a lot of bureaucracy. It sounds like because it's just such a, such a massive government agency. Exactly. Okay. So you just mentioned twice jujitsu. So you go to your, do you do that? Did you go to classes? Do you compete? And how does that work? 
Yeah, so I, I still do it. I've been doing it for about three and a half years now. So mm. it's something that I took up after I was blind. <laughs> um, but it's I, I do compete against people without disabilities. The only thing that we change, so the way that I learn in class is when the instructor is showing techniques to everyone else, I'm the dummy that he's showing it on so I can feel what he's doing. And then when I compete, it's the same thing. Um, in, instead of, you know, typically people start standing, but a couple feet apart and we start touching. So I get to grab, if we're in the gi, like that karate looking outfit, I get to yeah. grab one of their sleeves and a collar with the other hand and they get to do the same with me. And other than that, we just, it's, it's all the same. No kidding. So they're not beating the shit out of you just because you're blind. No, it's uh, there's no striking in jujitsu. It's all grappling and it's all based oh, gotcha. on, on joint locks or chokes okay. and making the other person submit. So yeah, I'm not just getting punched in the face for five minutes at a time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, plus it's gotta be a great workout too, right? I mean, physically in terms of fitness, it's probably pretty good. Yeah. It's a different kind of cardio. I've always been in shape and even now I lift weights six days a week, but like that, cardio it's like whole body cardio it's totally different than running or biking yeah. I, I love it now you have i guess it's safe to say that you have completely geez relearned how to live basically yeah. is yeah. that a fair statement yeah and i i've realized more recently as i started writing my book that it's been i've kind of had to redefine myself in the sense i i literally lost my sense of identity and have only really since my app came out last year, Xanagrams, it, I, I think I, I didn't realize it at the time that I, I felt like I really had no identity, but that's when I started making progress with getting sober. Um, and everything has really just gradually gotten better since then because my whole life had been service oriented, essentially like, mm -hmm. like there had been the Marines. And then when I got out and was going to college, I wanted to be an ER nurse and I was working in a hospital doing patient care stuff. And then like all of a sudden I couldn't do that. And believe I tried, I tried to find evidence of a blind nurse somewhere and it's just not a thing. Really? Uh, huh. so, well, it, the liability wise, like there's a lot of that stuff that is visual and sure, of course so it makes yeah. sense. But yeah, so I really, I struggled just kind of floundering for long time even when I, I got back into college after I lost my sight and I felt like you know looking back on last July when Xanagrams came out it's been like okay I've re-entered the world I'm doing something productive and that's helping others again and I think that was kind of the final piece that I needed to do you know I learned how to live lived on my own um, and all that stuff again but that was what I needed um, it's an amazing thing, really. I, I obviously I, I can't really identify with it, but I've I've talked on this podcast with a couple other people who um, uh, heavily into the addiction thing. Um, one of them was uh, this this woman, uh, Mary Beth O'Connor. She started drinking at age fourteen. She became addicted to crystal meth. She was an addict up until her thirties, but she wanted to be a lawyer, and that just kind of overtook everything. So she found a way to not only rehab and to cure, but then she became a lawyer and a, and a judge and was sober for 30 years. And then she wrote a book and, you know, like you, she found in sobriety, this kind of a new path and creativity was part of that path for her. And it was part of, I don't want to say cure because as, as a, I'm a you know recovered guy myself, I don't know that you're ever actually cured, but creativity plays such a huge role in shaping who you then become as I'm, I'm sure you found out in your case your creativity creativity took the role of learning how to code you know when you never did before and you know in my brief you know i do websites and i basically i do all the idiot proof stuff you know all the stuff that's you know templates and i can do a little yeah. bit of html but i'm a complete i tried to teach myself you know css once and coding forget it i have i can barely sit still during a class let alone do that but you did it and we're going to talk about more about why you decided to do that versus something else, although you did say you're writing. But um, so you've mentioned a couple times Xanagrams, the name of the app, and we brought it up earlier. Um, and you, uh, I, I have a couple screen grabs that I can show. They come from the the, the Xanagram uh, 
page uh, in the uh, in the Apple in the i in the iTunes Store. So it's just an Apple app at this point, right? It's not an Android app, which which is doesn't happen yet, or is it going to, or no? Correct. Um, we'll see. So I actually I'll be speaking at a, a big conference at the end of next month. It's called the Game Accessibility Conference. Um, hmm. Last year, I think they said eighty one hundred people attended, and it's all the the big game development studios come and hear people like me talk, but. As you can see, looking at Xanagrams, it's a word game. That's not anything groundbreaking. What is groundbreaking is all of the accessibility stuff that I mentioned, and so that's why I'll be speaking. And if it starts to kind of catch some or build up some momentum again, then I could see rewriting it to where it could be cross-platform. But for right now, I'm just focused on this new Now, what thing. you got to do is you got to hire yourself a posse to do that for you. Okay, that's what you got to do. I'm yeah, you just it right. hasn't made enough yet to do that. So. All right. Well, it will. Okay, it's uh, early on. What? Yeah. So does the the app actually? I'm guessing if you're totally blind, the app must make sounds or it speaks or how does how does the person actually play it? I guess there's sound involved, right? Yeah. So there's. I mean, just like when I use my computer, that we have software that's called screen reading software, and it kind of mm-hmm. sits behind the scenes and runs on everything. And so, what you're seeing, like where I'm trying to think of an example. Um, you know, like when you see the the buttons in there that have different letters on them, like my yeah. code reads that to a blind person letter by letter instead of blurting out the sound or okay. d- describes things. It's all really about providing context that I normally convey visually to people who can see that you don't, you can't if they're totally blind. And so... Yeah. It's a lot of stuff like that, vibrations, sound effects to just key in on other things that are happening. Yeah. And you see this as a, essentially a growth industry, I'm guessing, right? I mean, you see opportunities to do this bigger and better and different apps and not just games maybe, but other applications as well? Yeah. And this new project that I'm working on that'll build into something bigger is cross-platform and is not a game. It is It is a utilitarian thing that should hopefully be used by everybody but that's the that's the goal and if not it's cool because i'm putting something out into the world that is helping people i mean yeah. it's i i get a lot out of that and i feel i feel good about it so i'm content okay. and i just i like the process uh that's great cool because i have like no pro- no patience for processes you know i just kind of want things to happen by magic <laughs> I know that doesn't happen that way, but I can't, you know, you can't stop me from dreaming. Um, So I I guess um, my wife has for the last 20 plus years been a volunteer at a crisis hotline, like many around the country. And, you know, she gets not all of her calls are suicide calls. Some of them are, but most of them are people who just want to talk to somebody and then that's fine. But she's very much attuned to you know, kind of the whole concept of suicide prevention. Is there such a thing? And I I don't mean that to be a stupid or cold question. Is there, is that, is there such a thing as, as the ability to prevent suicide? I definitely think so. I, I have some very specific views on a lot of that, just given that I have the experience now, but I think there is what we don't think about is that a lot of that is on the person who's struggling and that's hard. It's, you know, I intentionally was hiding how, how bad I was doing behind the scenes so that there was no interference. And because I was afraid to speak up and I thought it was weak to speak up and on the, that, so I get asked a lot, you know, what are the warning signs and stuff like that? And they're a lot less overt, than I think people expect them to be. And I I do think there's a difference between someone who legitimately wants to commit suicide versus someone who thinks that they want to commit suicide. Um, Yeah, I think my wife has actually said that to me. Okay, yeah. The fact that somebody's actually dialing the line, you know, it's, it's, you know, they call it a cry for help. It's such a cliche. But if somebody actually reaches out and says, I want to do this, I guess a lot of times that's a sign that they really just want to be heard. I mean, you exactly. Me. Yeah. And, you know, so I have suicide on both sides of my family and suicide attempts on one side of my family. And, you know, there's there, it was more of the cry for help 
kind of stuff. And in, in my opinion, um, you know, where there's Facebook posts and things like that, that are obviously letting everyone know like, Hey, I'm not in a good spot. And mm-hmm. so that's, that's why I say that there's a difference, um, that I, I feel that there's a difference, but I, you know, for me, I was, I was very agitative and my behavior had changed just from the brain injury. I was, it was more impulsive and, and things like that and agitative, but some of that grumpiness was also because I was struggling and I wasn't sleeping because I was struggling, but mm-hmm. I really, I became very apathetic towards everything, but I again was keeping up appearances. So I'm, I was a big snowboarder. I still ski now. I suck at snowboarding now, but I still ski. Um, but you know, I would drive up to the mountains to go snowboarding and get there and be like, man, like trying to force myself to do something to get out of the house. And I'd get there and just not want anything to do with it. And then I would drive all the way home and that's like a six hour round trip. Yikes. Um, it was at the time. And so I'd just sit there in the parking lot. But then when I came home, it looked like I'd gone snowboarding. And it would be the same thing with my wow. dirt bike going to the racetrack. And so really all I, I was working out still, I was doing my homework and getting straight A's and showing up for work. But I, other than that, I was just, everything at home was drinking or being miserable. And yeah, that, and that's exactly why I say that, that stuff's a lot more kind of under the surface and mm-hmm. st- stuff that would only really be noticed if you really, really knew me. Um, and even then, again, I was intentionally hiding in. So my parents were at my apartment the day before I shot myself and had mm-hmm. no idea. They knew that I seemed tired and that I seemed grumpy. And that's it. And then the next day they got a call that, you know, I was in the ER with a bullet hole in my forehead. Yeah. So I, I, and I, I, I asked that question, uh, because, you know, I've been, uh, I've, I was an EMT for 22 years, uh, here in, in Fanwood and I'd been to a couple cases and we've also seen, you know, everybody has come in contact with somebody who has either done it or tried it. Yes. And the thing that you constantly hear is, you know, I just, nobody knew that there was anything wrong. It just seemed so unlike him or her. And, and I guess that's because of what you just said, you know, there, there are, there can be, there can be signs, but unless you really, really either live with the person or know the person or you're a parent, you don't necessarily see it all because, you know, people who are having trouble, they, as you did, they, they find ways to hide it. Right. And they deny it and whatever yeah. else. Well, and even I've, so I've struggled since I've been blind with depression um, for extended periods, like where I was suicidal, but I actually spoke up because I'd learned my lesson. But even then I was scared to tell my therapist that I was at that low of a point because I thought I'd get taken into the mental health ward and, Mm -hmm. you know, put in a padded room or something like that. And it's just, it's not the case, but I, I've really had to learn to view it as, and I, and I really think that like that time when I spoke up was one of the bravest things that I've ever done. Cause I was terrified of what was going to happen, but I knew that if I didn't speak up, I was going to end up in a really bad spot. And, but you know, it's, you have to speak up and you deserve that. If you're that person who's struggling and you may not feel that way because you're in that low of a spot and it's really not a sane state of mind, but you owe that to yourself and those around you to speak up and do something because it can get better, but you're going to have to put in the work and that work is usually really uncomfortable, but it does get easier. Yeah. It's well, like, thank God else. you spoke up and you put in the work and here you are and you're doing like, you're doing lots of good shit, man. That's, I mean, I just go to your website and I read all the stuff that you're doing and where you've been and where you're going and it's all very hopeful and positive. Um, I want to talk more about your creative juices and you're writing a book. I was going to say you got to write a book, but you're already <laughs> writing a book. Uh, and talk about like kind of the root of creativity and when that kind of started to bubble up in you after uh, we'll c- come back after I do my normal self-serving, uh, shameless self-promotion of my latest book. Folks, we right back with Zach Tidwell. Don't go away. And we're back with Marine veteran Zach Tidwell. What rank were you, by the way? I was a sergeant, so an E5 when I got out. Sergeant. Sergeant Zach Tidwell. Tidwell. Yeah. I love that. 
<laughs> I've seen a couple. So you posted a couple pictures of of yourself uh, in your dress uniform, I guess, back in the early days. And then there's another picture of you. Uh, it looks like you're in some kind of a swampy area. You're holding the gun like down at your side. It's it's, it's on, on one of your websites there. So there's plenty of evidence that you had your two deployments. You were fortunate not to see combat. Uh, which, you know, nobody wants their kid to see combat. My, my son is a cop. And, you know, fortunately, we live in a small town, so he doesn't actually see combat either, combat yeah. in quotes. But, you know, uh, any any kind of a service gig like that, you know, your mom and dad's always going to worry about you, as I'm sure yours did too. So um, when did it occur to you that you needed to, and that you could actually sit down and create something? So it's, it's interesting. I was actually, I was really, I drew a lot growing up and even as an adult, really? I could see. Yeah. So I always, I was creative. I just can't do that now. And so I, I started learning to play the guitar initially after I lost my sight. That's one of the things that they introduced me to at blind rehab. And then uh, I, you know, I don't think I had realized that I was missing the creative outlet like at, at the time because I started teaching myself how to code about three years ago. And so I, I'd been blind for a year and a half at that point. And I, I'd thought of guitar as my creative outlet at, at that point. And then when everything kind of came to a head while I was in college and a lot of my, my school, the materials and the platforms that I had to use to do homework or take tests weren't accessible with my screen reading software. And so the school literally assigned someone to be my eyeballs and like push buttons for me, tell me what's on the screen, push the button. And so your aptitude for coding did not come as a kind of an innate interest in that it came out of almost necessity. Yeah. And once I started looking into it and I found out that the cause of all that stuff was the code running behind the scenes of each app or website that I was accessing, I decided to drop out and teach myself. And so I started reading articles online and that's how I, I taught myself. And I just, I realized as I got the basics of it, I was like, okay, this is something, this is more than me doing something that I, I think will have an impact. Like I, I really have grown to the point where I'm kind of, I mean, it's, I look forward to it every day when I get up. It's That's really cool. Yeah. I, I spent a little bit of time reading on, I guess it's the Dark Horse website. You talk about how I do it, how you physically actually do it. And mm -hmm. um, you're going to help us explain this, but you're going to remember that we're most of us are nerdy guys. And, you know, we can barely put a sentence together, let alone figure out about coding. But basically, uh, you learn something called Xcode. And you use that in conjunction with, I guess, the Apple app called Voice uh, VoiceOver. That's so basically, screen. you're having your your computer is talking to you. It's speaking to you and making sounds, which assist you in typing the right stuff. Correct? Yeah. So my computer, like I'm, I just use a normal MacBook. It's a normal keyboard. VoiceOver is the screen reading software that I use. That's it's actually built into all Apple devices. Like your phone okay. has it on it right now. You just need to turn it on. It's really cool that they do that, and it's free. Um, but that reads textual information on the screen aloud to me. And so Xcode is the app that I have to write my code in. And okay. so I write human readable code, and then it compiles it down into binary and can put it on a device. And do you do you do it by typing? So do you actually yep. type it, or do you speak the speak the letters? I type everything, and so when there's issues, it sucks because I have to go character by character until yeah. I find like oh, oh I missed a bracket there or something. Oh, but it's um. So you yeah, had to exactly. learn typing as well. You had to learn a QWERTY keyboard, basically, correct? Yeah, and so all I've done, I have little dots on my keyboard that mark like my home keys, and then other okay. important keys on there. Um, sure, and that's really it other than that it's just memory at this point so the process then of coding uh, a game app where you're typing and your computer's talking back at you that must take like forever yeah i wish i had how long did phone. it really take let's try like like to make xanagrams from beginning to end where you finally had a finished you know product how long did that take it was all about, almost, it was about a year and nine months from the time I started teaching myself to the time that Santagrams hit the app store. 
But part of that's because I was learning. Going through the code, or even when I'm writing the book, isn't as painstaking as you would think because of how fast I can take in information when it's audible like that. Okay. It's interesting. Yeah. And so in writing, so you started, you started writing your book, correct? Correct. I'm and about are you, are you using words. voice recognition software or typing or both or what? I'm just typing in Word and it okay. works with my screen reader. So, oh. yeah. And screen um, reader, the screen reader you're talking about is voiceover? Um, that's the is one that, that I something? use on my phone and my Mac. But when I write, I use a, a Windows computer and I have to use a totally different screen reader because it's okay. Windows. But and it's so called the, Jazz. The screen reader tells you out loud what's on your screen? Yeah, anything that's textual. And again, it depends on the code of whoever wrote Microsoft Word and made it so that it can be accessible. But it. then the screen reader picks up on that stuff and reads it out loud. And it says, you know, when I type a letter, when I push a key on the keyboard, it says what I've typed. So The Xanagrams app is available in the uh, the Apple App Store, correct, to anybody? Yes, sir. And then uh, Dark Horse Game Studios, that's your business Yep. That's your, your corporate ID, your, your alter ego, as it were. Right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. There in your palatial estate in the Denver area. So what do you see coming up like in the future for you? Do you see your company expanding? You know, you're going to hire four or five guys to do all the grunt work while you sit and conceptualize. Is that the grand scheme here or what? What's What are your dreams going forward? That's this new, I mean, uh, Dark Horse is something I always want to have and will be something that I, I continually work on in the background on building new stuff. Um, this, this new thing that I'm building out will be like the real, th that is what I'm trying to turn into a, a larger company and plan to, and like have an actual business model and business plan and everything written up and, cool. and I've been pushing on. And then I do a lot of public speaking stuff and then the book and that stuff is all on ZachTidwell.net. Yeah, and once the book comes out, it's a whole new ball game. It means I'll be knocking on your door yet again, and all these other people <laughs> yeah. will be knocking on your door. Because once you have a book, it's like, wow, now you're an author. That's a whole another another thing. It's been a real privilege to meet you. Uh, you know, service people in general. Yeah, my uh, my daughter, one of my daughters in law, is from a military family, and you know, I grew up with lots of respect for cops and first responders, and then I became a first responder. You know, serving the public is about as good as it gets as far as I'm concerned. So, you know, I appreciate and respect you for doing that. But just to be able to reinvent yourself is just something that's just so foreign to, you know, those of us schleppers in the world who, you know, you're, 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 you know we're basically just complaining about our stupid bullshit every day when you've got, you know, look at all the stuff that you've overcome and you're and you're doing so great. I, I wish you nothing but the best with Dark Horse, with Xanagrams, and I can't wait till your book comes out. Zach Tidwell, it was great to meet you. Thank you so much. This was awesome. 